Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with stuffed pasta wheels. That's right, if I'd known these were going to come out as good as they did, I would use much more impressive ingredients for the filling than frozen spinach and canned meat. But despite the fact that I went full quarantine cuisine on these, it's actually the technique for how to make these that I want you to focus on, which really did work out incredibly well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a very simple pasta-like dough. And that'll begin with some all-purpose flour plus some salt. And then into the middle of that, we will crack one large egg, plus a small splash of cold, fresh water. And then what we'll do once we have everything in the bowl is go ahead and take a spoon, and we will stir this until it comes together to form a shaggy dough. Oh yeah, you heard me, a shaggy dough. And as usual, once we do have a shaggy dough formed, we will switch to our hands and press everything together. And then once that's almost happened, we'll go ahead and dump everything onto the table, where we will knead it for just about a minute or so. And yes, most pasta doughs are made with all eggs, but I was attempting to make the exact amount of dough I needed. And one egg was not gonna be quite enough moisture, but two eggs was gonna be too much. So I simply solved that problem by adding a little bit of water. And of course, if it feels a little bit sticky, go ahead and sprinkle some more flour on. And like I said, we will give that a quick kneading until it kind of smooths out. And we're left with a relatively firm, but still pliable disc of dough. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and wrap it in plastic. And we'll pop that in the fridge to rest for at least an hour before we try to roll it out. Okay, we never want to rush a dough. Always give it time to rest. And that will always make it easier to work with. And while that's resting, we can go ahead and make our filling, which I pretty much did with zero fresh ingredients, including one can of wild pink salmon, which isn't pretty, but it's pretty good for you and pretty good tasting. And what we'll do is break that up with a fork before very quickly hiding it with breadcrumbs. Oh yeah, that's better. And then to that, we will add a whole bunch of freshly grated Parmesan cheese, at which point we'll take a fork and give this a very thorough mix in before we add our wet ingredients. And by the way, regarding the cheese, I normally implore you to use the real stuff, the Parmigiano Reggiano, but I didn't this time. I actually used a Parmesan from Wisconsin, which I'm happy to report was pretty nice. But anyway, we will give that a very good mix before adding one package of frozen chopped spinach that we thawed first and then squeezed out all the water. I also tossed in a large egg, as well as a couple crushed garlic cloves. And then we'll want to season that up with some freshly ground black pepper, a few shakes of cayenne, and of course some salt at which point it was ready to stir together. And I wasn't really sure if I was going to need one or two eggs. And whenever we're not sure of that, we always want to just start with one. And then if it seems too dry, we can always add the other one, which this did. So I tossed that in and kept stirring, eventually ending up with the soft and spreadable filling I was hoping for. Which reminds me to remind you, this really is just a technique video. And you get to make any filling you want. I mean, you guys are after all the Daniel Steels of your pasta wheels. And speaking of trashy content, while the canned salmon and frozen spinach did come out pretty nice, any and all of your favorite ravioli fillings would work perfectly here. And that's it. Once our filling is set, we'll just wrap that up and pop it in the fridge until we're ready to use it. And then assuming our dough's rested long enough, we'll go ahead and pull that out. And we'll unwrap it and transfer it onto a well-floured surface. And then before we start rolling, we'll use our hands to kind of form this into a rectangular shape. And then once that happens, we'll go ahead and switch to the rolling pin. And then using just enough flour so it doesn't stick, we will attempt to roll this out into a fairly squarish rectangle, about an eighth of an inch thick. And if I have to give you a measurement, it's probably something close to 14 by 12. But as I'm doing a fine job demonstrating, it does not have to be perfectly shaped. So this is what I ended up with. And I was pretty happy with it. Or at least that's what I told it. And then one little trick here once that's rolled out, is to take our rolling pin and sort of flatten out that far edge a little more. Okay, that's gonna be the edge that we roll towards. And I think this is gonna seal and look a little better if that's a little thinner along that edge. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and transfer on our filling, pretty much going all the way to the edges, except for about three or four inches along that edge we just spoke of. And we'll attempt to distribute that and spread it out as evenly as possible. And then before we roll this up, we should probably take a pastry brush, or better yet, a couple clean fingertips and we will slightly dampen that exposed dough before very carefully and very confidently rolling this up. And we definitely want to roll it fairly tight so we don't have any big air pockets, but we also don't want to smash and press that filling too much either. So take your time and try to roll this up as uniformly as possible. Okay, we really do want to try to end up with a very consistent girth. And once we have that almost all the way rolled up, 
Because we didn't have a perfect rectangle, it's always a good idea to kind of stretch out those corners a little bit before we finish the roll. And because our dough along that edge was damp, this should seal very nicely. And then what we'll do once we have that rolled up and sealed, with of course the seam on the bottom, and we've done a little bit of fine tuning if needed, is that we'll dust the table with a little more flour, since we're gonna to move to the trimming, cutting, and shaping stage. And this part is optional, but if you do have a little bit of extra dough at the ends that you don't think has any filling in it, you can go ahead and trim a little bit off, which I did. And yes, in case you're wondering, I'm using a very cheap and dull knife. But anyway, whether we trim that or not, we're gonna to wanna to cut this into eight equal pieces. Oh, and see how I just cut that by pressing down? That's probably not the best way. Okay, it's probably better if you use a little bit of a sawing motion as you go through to get a little bit of a cleaner cut without smashing everything. And then what we'll do once we have that successfully sectioned is give these a little light pressing with some floured fingers to sort of flatten them out a little bit. And to make that a little bit easier, I'm gonna go ahead and spread these out so we have a little more room to work with. And that's it, once we have those cut and flattened out a little bit, we'll go ahead and brown those up in a nonstick pan set over medium heat in a little bit of olive oil, which is probably only gonna take you a couple minutes per side. But you'll know, because both sides will look golden brown. Oh, and if you're into multitasking, while those are browning up, we can go ahead and prep our baking dish or pan, which I've done by adding about an inch of a very thick marinara sauce to the bottom. And then to that, I decided to add some cumin and some smoked paprika, along with a splash of water. And I went with those ingredients because I thought they would pair nicely with my spinach and salmon. And they did. But of course, like the filling, you go ahead and use whatever kind of sauce you want. And then what we'll do once that's set, and our stuffed pasta wheels have been beautifully browned, is go ahead and transfer those in using the old 21212 positioning method. Oh, and definitely feel free to add more liquid if you want. All right, I intentionally wanted this to be sort of thick after it roasted so that I would end up with almost like a tomato chutney. But if you wanted, you could make this a lot saucier. And these will be fine even if you cover them completely. And speaking of covering, we'll grate a little more Parmesan over the top. And that's it, once cheesed, these are ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about a half hour or so, or until they look like this. And I've made a lot of stuffed pasta recipes in my day, baked and otherwise, but I've never seen anything that comes out looking quite like this. So these really are truly unique in appearance. But anyway, I'm gonna let these rest for about five minutes before serving them up. And in the meantime, if you wanna clean up some of the splatters from the edge, you can do that very carefully with a damp rag, but don't press too hard or you will burn yourself and I'll get blamed. So I did a little bit of cleanup and then went ahead and served these up. And I'm gonna go with two wheels per order. Along with, of course, my cumin and smoked paprika scented tomato sauce, or as I'm calling it on the menu, roast tomato chutney. And in a perfect world, I would have finished up with some freshly chopped Italian parsley, but we are far from being in a perfect world. And I didn't have any, but I did have some beautiful extra virgin olive oil. So I drizzled some of that over the top. And I actually thought this dish looked gorgeous in its own unique provocative way. So I grabbed a fork and knife and dug in, and I was absolutely thrilled with how these came out. And not only with how they tasted, which was fine, especially considering the unremarkable ingredients I used, but what I really enjoyed about this technique the most was the tremendously enjoyable texture of the pasta. Okay, you know how when you make lasagna, there are those parts of the pasta on the edges and corners that get all crusty? This had a lot of that going on. And then to contrast that, on the inside, we had wonderfully tender, perfectly cooked pasta. So texturally speaking, I thought this was an absolute triumph. And if I had known it was gonna come out this well, I would have thrown on a mask and gone out and gotten some fresh meat and vegetables and cheese. And pretty much any filling you enjoy in a ravioli or tortellini or cannelloni would be absolutely perfect used with this technique. Which is why no matter what you use, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.